by Spotlight Zimbabwe. Q&A interview with Jonathan Moyo. Former cabinet minister, Jonathan Moyo JM speaks to Spotlight Zimbabwe editor, Itai Mushikwayam. Professor Jonathan Moyo, thank you for giving us your time to attend to this your first ever interview with Spotlight Zimbabwe. I am, what is your current assessment of the political and economic situation in Zimbabwe? President Emerson Nangagwa has been talking about a so-called Second Republic aimed at opening the country for business with the globe, yet he has admitted at international forums such as the World Economic Forum WEF that Zimbabwe's economy and currency has collapsed. Is this man fit to be president? JM, as I understand it, the nub of your question is whether Nangagwa is fit to be president. In light of the ongoing destruction of livelihoods on an industrial scale against the backdrop of the collapse of the economy in two short years, the answer to the question whether Nangagwa is fit to be president is blowing in the wind as a resounding no from all angles and perspectives. Nangagwa's descriptions of Zimbabwe since the November 2017 military coup as the Second Republic was not a well-considered ideological or policy template to create investment and business opportunities in the country, but just rehearsed hot air that even Nangagwa himself has since abandoned. The bottom line is that Nangagwa is not presidential material. He is a mean-spirited and cruel intelligence Kun clan politician who has had the presidency thrust upon him by a military coup. He does not know what to do with the presidency because he knows no statecraft besides spilling blood, torturing people and looting state coffers through cartels of one sort or another. The devastating reality of Nangagwa's presidential incapacity speaks for itself. The writing on the widening and deepening political crisis and economic meltdown in Zimbabwe is on the wall, and everyone can see that Nangagwa has failed not only to turn around the economy and facilitate international engagement to halt the ongoing destruction of livelihoods, but also to unite and rally his party, his cabinet, his politburo, the security forces and services, the public services, the business community and professionals, let alone the country. In two very short years, Nangagwa has turned Zimbabwe into a Habesian state of nature where life is poor, nasty, brutish and short, with everyone fighting against everyone. Instead of galvanizing the country, he has polarized and primitivized it. I am, the late President Robert Mugabe in September 2017, during a presidential youth interface meeting at Chipet Stadium in Vindora, intimated that the bad blood between President Nangagwa and yourself stems from the 2004 Chilacho declaration that saw you being expelled from ZANU-PF. Have you personally fallen out with the president, and is the bad blood real? JM, that's what the pro-Nangagwa CIO elements told President Mugabe, but the truth is different and more nuanced than that. Nangagwa himself knows better that I have never had time or respect for him, and he also knows the reasons why. A lot of outright lies have been told about the so-called Chilacho Declaration to a point where it has become a useless legend. There isn't much more to say about that as I have exposed the lies in various fora, including most recently in my book on how the 2018 presidential election was stolen for Nangagwa, Exelgate. Many say I was expelled from ZANU-PF after the Chilacho saga, or because of it, but that's not true. Rather, I was considered to have expelled myself after I sought the Chilacho parliamentary seat in 2005 as a ZANU-PF independent. Yes, I contest it as a ZANU-PF independent. This fact is ignored or misrepresented by people with their own agendas. My 2005 election manifesto was expressly ZANU-PF through and through. Yet there's lots of garbage about that out there. On the so-called Chilacho Declaration, contrary to the self-indulgent claims that I organized it for Nangagwa and that I had a major fallout with him after he allegedly did not support me. When I was expelled from ZANU-PF, the truth is that the event was organized by Jacob Mudenda, who was then chairman of ZANU-PF's Matabela and North Province. Mudenda worked with Belief Gall, who was then the party's Chilacho District Coordinating Committee BCC. The two approached me only a few days before the event to help them extend an official invitation to Nangagwa with whom they were already in contact. Having attended a similar event in his honor, some weeks earlier, at which he was the guest of honor at a speech and prize-giving day at Mtaleo High School in Gwanda, Matabela and South. 
the request by Mudenda Ungal for me to officially invite Nangagwa plus some cabinet ministers was done as a ploy by Nangagwa's cronies to have my fingerprints in the organization of the event in order to get me to be seen as having endorsed it. In particular, Gaul did this because he knew that I was vehemently opposed to Nangagwa's shenanigans. In the end, I accepted to extend the invitations and I asked Francis Nima to go with me to Parliament Building to invite Nangagwa with whom I had no communication or access. Nima did all the talking and Nangagwa was only too happy to accept the invitation, which he had in fact engineered. I accepted the request from ZANU PF Matabel and North Province and the party's Jalacho DCC after resolving that I, with others I was in communication with in Matabel and on how best to deal with the region's vaccine problems, would use the opportunity to get Nangagwa to come to terms with and atone for his Gukura Hundi atrocities by supporting the region's developmental agenda. In addition, I saw Nangagwa's quest for a seat in ZANU PF's presidium as an opportunity to reform the presidency of the party and ipso facto of the country's presidency by rotating it among the Zazaras, Karangas, Manyakas, and Nabels. I wrote about this at the time in the Zimbabwe Independent. There was no question of me supporting Nangagwa for any office. He knew and understood that very well. That's why Nangagwa publicly distanced himself from me one week after the Chalat show event at a meeting convened by President Mugabe at Ellen Janney Training Center in Bulawayo to review the so-called Chalat show declaration. In any event, what President Mugabe described as bad blood between Nangagwa and me did not start with the Chalat show event. It's been always there since the Gukura Hundi days. Nangagwa personally and physically masterminded and coordinated the mass murder of our fathers, mothers, siblings, relatives and friends in Matabeland. He is the butcher of Matabeland. One of the major reasons I went into active ZANU-PF politics was to decisively deal with Nangagwa, politically. My confronting him directly and openly in Mugabe's last days from 2015 to 2017 was not a coincidence or an 11th hour or last minute thing, but a culmination of a long-standing purpose. So, you see, there's more than bad blood between Nangagwa and me. It's a clash over integrity, common decency and the meaning of humanity itself. Nangagwa is not just unpresidential or unfit to be president, he's inhumane. He defends his criminality by inventing crimes and all manner of nonsense against his opponents. In 2004 Nangagwa got his Mbarangwa clan to invent a sexual orientation for me to falsely claim that I am gay. They did this by using Munirazi Pwengwir, who was then George Charamba's deputy in the information ministry, to introduce to the ministry alum Pofu, a Nangagwa protege, as a prospective CPC CEO. Wengwir explained to us that alum Pofu had worked in the middle management ranks of SABC and that he was a strong ZANU PF cadre close to Nangagwa. At the time, Wengwir, a former student of mine, had my ear, not least because he was a hard working and competent public servant. Alum Pofu was well spoken. My inclination, and that of Gideon Gono who was then CBC board chairman, had been to hire Nan Maruta, but when we and company prevailed with their choice of alum Pofu and got the ministry to hire him. In the early days of his assignment at ZBC, Pofu was impressive in terms of his planning and vision articulation. But in no time, the ministry started hearing stories of alum Pofu and boys at Pockets Hill. The stories were of nauseating promiscuity. Then the ministry was hit by the scandal that broke the camel's back when the press ran headline stories about a lumpofu caught in a compromising gay storm at Tipperary Club in Harare, owned by Pearson Valequa, another Nangagwa protege. After that incident, ridiculous stories started flying around in Nangagwa circles that a lumpofu and Jonathan Moyo were having a gay relationship. It was rank madness. A sexual orientation had been invented for me, and the rest became history. It's notable even to this day that it's Nangagwa's people who ran and rave about the sexual orientation they invented for me in 2004. Apart from my objection to their ridiculous invention, I strongly object to their weaponizing a sexual orientation, which as 3 sexual orientation is a human right, as an insult and a term of demonization for their political purposes. But that is Nangagwa for you. There's more about him. If you point out his murderous record, 
He'll seek to silence you by getting his cronies to falsely accuse you of being a murderer. If you expose his looting history, he'll unleash his minnows to accuse you of being a thief. This is because Nangagwa has no moral compass that enables him to tell right from wrong. In his worldview, wrong is right and foul is fair. An example of this is how in 2016 Nangagwa unleashed Good Sunguni, who was then CACC's commissioner responsible for investigations against Godfrey Gandawa and Mian trumped up SIMDEF charges simply because we were uncompromisingly opposed to his vacuous succession agenda. The situation was so ridiculous that when professional ZACC investigators were indicating to ZACC commissioners that there was no evidence to support the allegations against us, Commissioner Nguni himself directly went to Zimdep offices to ransack documents as an investigator when he was not. The false and manifestly insane charges against us were formulated after the patently illegal investigation by Nguni. Later the magistrate's court declared all the search warrant used by CACC to be illegal. But you never hear about that. Instead, Nangagwa and his cronies keep singing their lies about Zimdef. Interestingly, if not revealingly, Nangagwa has publicly said that he dismissed Nguni and all the other ZACC commissioners who served with him because he found that they were corrupt. How do you reconcile the fact that it is those commissioners, and in my case Nguni in particular, who filed corrupt charges against me in pursuit of a naked political agenda for Nangagwa? Why is it that ZACC commissioners whom Nangagwa has publicly said were corrupt have not been charged of corruption and brought to the courts of law to answer to the charges? It is obvious that the reason is because Nangagwa used them to get what he wanted against people like me who were opposed to his succession scheme. I'm confident that one day the full story will be told about how Nangagwa corrupted some elements of the criminal justice system to criminalize and delegitimatize his political opponents like me. I am, you were the first cabinet minister to warn President Mugabe about the November 2017 coup before it took place, but it all seems to have fallen on deaf ears. Do you think President Nangagwa would be in power right now, had President Mugabe acted swiftly on the intelligence you provided, JM? No I don't think President Mugabe would be in power right now, if he had listened to my warnings about an impending military coup. Rather I think, without playing God, he would be alive today and enjoying some peace of mind as a former president, the head of state and government right now would have been President Drive Sydney Sikarame in Zimbabwe would be doing very well as a society undergoing generational transition, leadership renewal and economic revival. I am, former first lady, Grace Mugabe, has previously accused President Nangagwa of harboring ambitions to stage coup plots which can be traced as far back as 1980, when he reportedly unsuccessfully attempted to wrestle power from President Mugabe soon after the country's first democratic elections. A coup attempt allegedly implicating Nangagwa took place in 2007, during which you were an independent legislator. Government claimed the coup d'etat involved almost 400 soldiers and high-ranking members of the military that would have occurred on June 2 or June 15, 2007, Fast forward to January 2020, when he made revelations through a Twitter thread that President Nangagwa had foiled another military putsch attempt in November 2019 against his administration. Now there is growing speculation of yet another coup, and you have observed that this month could spell the end for the current government. Is Nangagwa going to be toppled from power by a coup from the perspective of the political scientist that you are? JM, the narrative popularized by Grace Mugabe about Nangagwa's coup mentality that predates 18 April 1980 is not hers or her origination and creation. It's a narrative that President Mugabe himself used to tell on many occasions, including after the November 2017 coup. What emerges from the narrative is that Nangagwa fancied himself coming into power through some combined use of witchcraft, pseudo-operations engineered by CIO elements from his clan, and a military operation of one sort, or another masterminded by his tribal general supported by former Rhodesian CIOs or apartheid operatives he worked with in the 1980s to create super Zapu dissidents who were run by the CIO to justify atrocities in Matabelan. Nangagwa's balkanized and tribalized interests have defined his politics of exclusion, which are now epitomized by crude cartels fronted by conspicuously corrupt individuals like Kuta Tagware. 
It is not surprising that when Nangagua finally got his clue wish in November 2017, that did not come with broad-based support in the military or ZANU-PF, let alone in the country. This explains why the public euphoria for the coup was short-lived, because it was more about support for Mugabe's departure than about support for Nangagwa's arrival. Nangagwa's unpopularity with the middle and lower ranks of the military remains his biggest challenge, given the fact that he came into power on the back of a military coup. His political ground has been particularly shaky since November 2019, when he precariously foiled an insurgency by army elements against his embattled administration.